to Lexington this uh, morning today. And uh, first of all, I thank uh, the gracious hosts from Washington and New York for hosting our meeting today. Um, special. <laughs> thank you very much. <clears throat> also want to uh, thank our sponsors for the meeting, uh, Westlaw for our breakfast this morning, and Lexus and Nexus as well. Okay. Um, finally, just a quick also thank you personally to the program committee. Miller, Kathy Columbia, for helping us put together a great program. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, quick opening remarks, a couple things. Um, I was told bathrooms are just outside, ladies' room right out there, and the men sort of had to walk past towards the library on the other end. Is that correct? Just through the doors. Just through the doors, yes. So anyone needs to use those, they're there. Um, and according to our program, uh, got three presentations for you today. The first one will be coming from Eric Mill from the Sunlight Foundation, who will talk ab about their, pro um, their organization as well as um, open access to government information. Our second speaker, who hopefully will be here soon, <laughs> Waldo Jayquith, will be speaking next. And he'll also be talking about um, his pro um, project called the State Decoded. Um, so another open access um, uh, program that they that they run. So then after that and lunch, uh, possible tours of the library, uh, then our hosts from Washington Lee will speak on their digital law repository that they've set up, talk about their um, situation or their um, process and how they created that for their university. Okay. Um, and that's, that's our plan for today. Oh, and after that would be our business meeting. So <laughs> please stick around for that. <laughs> All right. Uh, without further ado then, we'll, I'll introduce Eric. Eric is from the Selmat Foundation. He, is, he does software development and tech policy for them. He's also a board member of the DC chapter of Awesome Foundation. Uh, keeps a blog at K-O-N-K-L-O-N-E. Conquer one? It's not important. Not important? <laughs> Dot com. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, Eric. Sure. Not quite sure that turned this screen on. Thank you. Um, right. So, thank you for having me here. Uh, I, so, my name is Eric Mill, and I, I work at an organization called the Sunlight Foundation. Um, actually, I'm just curious. To the law library community. Did, has anybody heard of Sunlight Foundation before? Okay, so maybe about half of you. Um, so we're an, an organization of about, about 50 people. It's, it's fairly large. And we've been around since 2006. And we are about transparency and open government, uh, open data especially. Um, and everything we do is informed by technology. So we have an extensive technology team. So about 18 of those 50 people are on the technology team, about a dozen of them are developers and some designers, and uh, it's a very large team. And we have we have a lot of policy people and journalists, but everybody fundamentally is talking about how technology can make government more transparent um, and more accountable and more open. Uh, so uh, I am not going to talk. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about a couple of our products that don't represent the full breadth of our work. For example, I'm not going to talk about campaign finance or influence. With which we do a great deal of reporting and data. Um, but I'm going to talk about a couple of our things. And basically my plan here is just to open your morning by overloading you entirely. I have about 30 tabs <laughs> open. Uh, so I'm going to go over uh, a constellation of things. And I, I really, I'm going to try to get across um, just how much work people are doing, how diverse it is and where and, and all the places that it's happening. And then I really want to emphasize the value of open collaboration on small pieces. So to um, start off with a, a couple of our, our products that I think are the most relevant here, we have uh, a project called Open States uh, that is, uh, I actually don't work on this myself, but it's maybe the project I most admire at our organization. So this is a project that we started uh, about four years ago uh, in 2009 to gather uh, information on the legislative work of all 50 states. So for its first three years, this was fundamentally just a data gathering project. Um, and it took that long to do. So uh, state legislatures, you know, each of them have different websites. Very few of them publish actual data. 
you know, spreadsheets or other formats. Um, usually they're just websites, PDFs sometimes, that sort of thing. Uh, and of course they're all totally different. Uh, and if you want to, you know, follow how a, an issue is tracing through state legislation, uh, at that time anyway, you generally had to go and sh shell out thousands of dollars to a company that would happily do all that hard work of tracking the chaos of 50 different state legislative processes. So we wanted to try to make that more accessible to everybody. And so we started a project to uh, essentially reverse engineer the websites and data portals of all 50 states one by one. And that's a gargantuan task, and we actually activated a lot of volunteers uh, around the country. We went to uh, Python conferences in particular, and uh, got you know, civically minded developers to take an interest in uh, sort of adopting their state and doing the work to, to solve that state's problem. We basically just provided the spec of like, to, you know, one, once you get information from your state, put it in this format, it'll flow into this public shared commons of state, state legislature information. So that took us about three years to hit 50 states on, and then we spent another year making an actual website uh, for people that to come in and actually see what's happening in their state. And you know we could do a pretty pretty okay job at uh, you know actually exposing like state legislature state legislative work uh, of every state and providing things that are really only possible once you've done this for everything. You know, uh, so that we can see how immigration law is actually playing out across all 50 states at once. Um, we actually did uh, an analysis um, soon after the Trayvon Martin uh, incident in Florida, where we took a look at um, stand your ground laws as they were tracing around through the 50 states. Uh, and we, we did that using some fairly sophisticated text analysis, but it was only possible because we got the corpus of legislation that we had taken the time to gather. So that, this is an example of us going very deeply uh, into a set of data. Uh, this is also, this is a, a report card that we ended up issuing as a result. Uh, lots of people give report cards uh, to, you know, pieces of government. A lot of people give transparency report cards to pieces of government. Uh, we wanted to focus ours on actual data issues. Uh, so ease, machine readability, standards, timeliness, permanence, you know, do URLs break, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, most states didn't really do too good. Uh, and we were able to actually get uh, responses from a fair amount of them, some of which improved their, their processes, so we were able to upgrade some of their grades. What did Virginia I'm sorry? What was Virginia's grade? Oh, good call. Let's take a look. Um, Virginia, A, look at that. Very nice. Yeah, OK, well, all right. Yeah, so we actually, upon request of the justification, so we gave uh, a one for, what's that, access, I assume, machine readability. That, that's been the case uh, in some, some places where uh, you, once you get to know the IT person at that state legislature, <laughs> they can hook you up. And so we, we've done that where, you know, that's fine, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, of course, it's always better if the data is just available to everybody publicly. And of course, through us it is. We offer this data, uh, all the data that we collect from whatever state, no matter how good of a job they do, uh, in bulk and by API. Uh, and we have code to make that easier for people to use. And people do use it quite a bit. And this website in general has been very highly trafficked uh, because we're the only free source for all this stuff. Uh, I, I will need to move a little faster than this to get through my stuff. Um, but we have, so this is actually something that I built. Uh, this is called Scout. And this, instead of going deeply into one thing, this is about going through a broad set of data. Um, so we did this for ourselves, first and foremost, because we care about following transparency issues, such as the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and so uh, in this case, well, I'll take transparency. Um, so this is an attempt to do sort of federated search over bills as they go through Congress, as they're introduced, uh, through speeches that get made on the floor. Uh, through state legislation, and this is using the data that we gathered in open states. Uh, through federal regulations as well, uh, and that's something that uh, I really think the public sector could do a much better job of following, it's the regulatory process. Uh, and we also added in GAO reports. Um, I'm gonna mention this a little bit later too. Um, and this is the result of uh, you know, me spending a day uh, reverse engineering GAO's website, gathering its information, 
publishing that as data, making it searchable, so that we can plug it into a product like this. Um, but that, you know, it's, and I'll come back to this point, but it's an example of where it doesn't take a lot of effort uh, if, you have, if you have a little bit of technological resources to make something new and neat happen. Um, and another thing that I'll come back to in a bit is uh, because we're, you know, we, our, our policy team is you know, fairly expert on following issues in the law, and this audience in particular knows the value of understanding how the U.S. code works. So uh, this is a special feature that I built in where if you type in something that looks like a, uh, a, a U.S. code citation, we can do much smarter search. So the search term here is 5 U.S.C. 552, but we will match on the, where it's a thing that's broken into a sentence, which is how legislation usually does it. Uh, it's usually a more informal way of describing it. Uh, we can uh, handle it if it has subsections attached, whether it has dots or not, that sort of thing. Uh, or if it has that you know, weird Latin section symbol or whatever that is. Um, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to this uh, in a little bit. So now to jump off of Sunlight's products, I want to show just briefly a few other things that other people in the community are doing. This is GovTrack. Has anybody ever used this site before? This has been around forever. This has been around since 2004, uh, and it, I, I know forever, right? But uh, in terms of like the open government movement, this was uh, very ahead of its time, and uh, also had the, the fairly radical idea at the time of, you know. The official website is not very good, so we can do a better job. I will reverse engineer that website because they don't publish data. I will take it and actually demonstrate what you could do when you have this data. And GovTrack has been extremely successful, and the, its proprietor, Josh Tauber, is basically a one-man operation, by the way. Uh, has been since 2004. And, it's, and that one man, that uh, proprietor Josh, has uh, been extremely effective in getting Congress uh, to step up its game uh, in terms of publishing more information. And it's a good example of him aligning his own incentives of, I want to make GovTrack better with the public, so uh, we should have better access to information generally. Uh, one of my other favorite projects is something called Court Listener. Um, this is, I think, maybe is a little bit less well known. I, 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 I keep trying to get my colleagues to really pay attention and use this, and sometimes I have a tough time with it. But it, it is an extremely impressive, it's, very, it's a lot like Scout, which I just showed, actually, except it focuses on court opinions from around a hojillion courts. So uh, every circuit court, appeals court, U.S. tax court, a bunch of state bankruptcy courts, uh, I'm just continuing to scroll here, state supreme courts, uh, state courts of appeals, uh, somewhere in there was the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Uh, and it is uh, an example of gathering a bunch of data and providing a very simple feature of you know, actually searching through all of this stuff at once, and it will deliver you uh, free email alerts on this. Now, you can, certainly you can get you know, crazier features from something like Westlaw and Lexis, but there's a lot of stuff that is relevant just from opinions that get published from around, around the country. And that information is free, and it's public domain, and it should be, there should be free services like this that make it available. And just like the services I was talking about, in this case, the data is also available as a separate project. So uh, anybody can take this information and go, you can make your own court listener if you wanted to, but you probably wouldn't. You'd probably do something else with it because uh, court listeners already doing a good job. And you would use it to do whatever you wanted. You could do your own analysis on the text of it. Um, there, somewhere here there's a coverage graph that I'm looking for. Um, the, uh, with a, yeah, the coverage in, in recent eras is, is pretty good. Um, and it, you can see for each court just how good of a job a court listener does in gathering it. It, it gathers a lot of this information from, some of you may know public resource, Carl Malamud. Uh, some of that has come from Recap. Some of that came from uh, Aaron Swartz's giant pacer grab in 2010. Uh, and a lot of this comes, uh, yeah, you can see about a third of it, uh, comes from their own scraper framework called Juriscraper, which is a, community, a very open states-like uh, project that has a bunch of volunteers and, and uh, and, and Court Listener itself doing the work to scrape opinions from all over the country. Uh, so this actually just came out last week, and this is a government project. This is uh, made by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This is a platform they made called eregs, and it is uh, taking, in this, in this case, they're actually just focusing on a particular regulation about electronic fund transfers uh, that CFPB has regulatory authority over. And they uh, decided to make a framework that parses regulations uh, in their original kind of ugly plain text form, uh, learns to understand them, 
and then visualizes them uh, for you and lets you navigate through them. It's, it doesn't, this is a 1024 by 768 resolution and some stuff is getting cut off. Uh, but maybe if I, yeah, okay, it's a little better. Um, but you, you know, they'll do things like connect the official interpretation of regulations to that regulation. Uh, you know, they'll highlight relevant things for you to jump around and see the legal definitions of those things. You know, they, they're smart enough to like, uh, you know, have the versions of different law or different regulations over time. It's extremely amazing, and they did this as a government agency, and people don't usually expect a lot of government agencies, technology-wise. Um, and they're also very active in the open source world, and they have open sourced the work of all of this stuff. And they didn't just open source the whole giant website, but they actually took the time to do this in a very smart way that reflects an understanding of technology, where they split it up into a few different projects, where you have a site about displaying the regulations, uh, an API for transmitting that as data, and most importantly, they have a regulations parser, whose sole purpose is just to do a really good job of parsing regulations. Um, it's a little technical how they're describing here, because parsing is a technical task, but the, the point is that by breaking it out like that, they make it possible for other people to parse regulations and make things that aren't e-things, but they've still lowered the barrier drastically to working with regulations in all sorts of forms. Um, and so I wanted to point to an example of government doing an excellent job on that front, too. Um, now, I'm here on, on GitHub, and I, I want to actually, now I want to take a sec to ask, uh, who here has, has heard of GitHub? Anybody? Okay, a couple people. All right, so just two, so not many. And, uh, and I, and I want to talk a little bit about this, because um, it's going to frame a lot of the, the rest of this. Um, GitHub is basically a platform for uh, technical collaboration, and actually increasingly not just technical collaboration, but collaboration generally. Um, originally designed for coding and technical collaboration, and so most, it can still feel fairly intimidating to a non-technical audience, um, but increasingly, uh, more and more work is getting done here of all kinds. Um, in fact, just last night, uh, somebody, uh, this guy Clay, opened an, uh, an issue just to talk about how it would be nice to have this, the Code of Federal Regulations parse to visualize the federal acquisition regulation. And I, you know, I was able to talk to him and tell him about the, the EREX tool that I just demonstrated. Um, and you know maybe that will turn into something down the line. Um, this is so to, to back up a little bit here. Uh, I, I showed a bunch of tools here um, uh, that Sunlight ran and that the community runs and has built. Um, and these are the, the most public, visible, branded projects. That, um, you know, that's what they are. They're visible, branded things. But there's a great deal of collaboration and project work that happens sort of under the surface that I'd really like to draw attention to. So. Um, there are many, this is not the only project like this, but a project that I've been involved in um, is something that we've been calling the United States Project. Uh, and this is pr has primarily so far been a collaboration between um, Sunlight, uh, GovTrack, which I showed earlier, and also the New York Times, which actually does a fair amount with congressional information. They have a, a pretty well-known voting data portal and API. Uh, there's a guy, Derek Willis, there that does a lot of great work on congressional data. Um, and we basically started, uh, started this project because we, we were all doing the same work to make our projects. So we were all building up a database about members of Congress. We were all uh, reverse engineering how Thomas.gov works uh, at the Library of Congress because you need that information to do anything data-wise with legislation in Congress. Uh, and so we basically were like, well, why don't we just have, you know, sort of isolate that part and share our work there, make that a piece of shared investment, so we don't have to solve that problem anymore. Um, and so this has actually taken the form of a, an organization like GitHub. So GitHub uh, is, is a project hosting and collaboration system that is, is built a lot like a social network. Um, and I, I mean that very literally. You can follow people on it. You can star things to make people feel good about themselves. You can <laughs> comment on everything people do. Uh, you can watch different projects as they move, and you can develop a reputation, all of those things, but they're all, unlike a lot of other social networks, this is actually grounded in producing things uh, of value to the world. Uh, and and that, that's one of the things I like about it. So, you know, all of our discussion forums that we have here on this, pro this project are all about trying to get to our resolution. We're trying to close these issues, not just talk about them indefinitely, but resolve them and solve problems. So, the two projects that we, we started out here uh, that we built this organization around. Um, this is a, uh, 
a, bit, a database, a data set of members of Congress. So um, it looks a little bit like this. We've designed it to be actually somewhat readable. This is a data format called YAML that you probably haven't encountered, but it is designed for readability and it's designed for each piece of information to be on its own line. So a little easier for you know, people new to data formats to work with. Uh, it has a bunch of benefits, but this is what our data looks like. And so these are, uh, we, have, we basically just keep files that have, that break down for each member of Congress. Uh, you know, how does their name break out? What's their birthday? For every term that they served, you know, when did it start? When did it end? What party were they? What district did they represent? What was their website? What was their office? You know, their phone number, that sort of thing. What is their ID on a whole bunch of services? What ID are they used on in POS? Uh, how about the bio guide, vote smart, that's sort of, the FEC, that sort of thing. And this is something that everybody needs. Um, and you know, it's not, a, a, this isn't a glamorous project. We're keeping a bunch of YAML files and we have a bunch of uh, scripts that keep different parts of it up to date automatically because none of us wants to keep updating this by hand all the time. Um, so we automate as much of it as possible, maybe 99% of it. Um, but one, you know, once we have this canonical data set assembled, we can use it in anything we want to. Uh, and this data set ends up getting fed into, into actual you know, campaigns that people run to contact Congress. And, and, we, and it works our way into the branded products that I showed before. Uh, and just as an example you know, of what collaboration this kind of looks like, this is Josh from GovTrack adding Wikipedia names uh, based on a table that uh, the Cato Institute assembled for a separate project. And uh, you can just see a you know, little plus sign with a green highlight of you know, Wikipedia names being added. So GitHub actually also affords us the ability to see changes to our information over time, which is actually, you know, over, uh, is actually fairly profound over time. Uh, now the other project that we did that I mentioned is that we, we all needed to keep uh, reverse engineering TOS. Um, it's being replaced by congress.gov now, um, but congress.gov is also not a data source. They've decided not to publish their data. And that's something I'll return to a little bit later. Um, so we'll end up reverse engineering congress.gov once Thomas shuts down. But we've been reverse engineering Thomas for a while. Uh, and we basically wrote, a, you know, automated the process of doing it. And we publish, uh, these are zip files containing all the data that we download back to 1973, which is how far Thomas goes. We have one for the current Congress. It's updated nightly. And it, in this case, it's, it's not YAML. It's a different format called JSON that is somewhat readable, a little less so, um, that just gathers, this is, uh, the example here is uh, Obamacare, it's PIPACA, uh, the, the Affordable Care Act, and this is just gathering the data of like, what its titles were at different times, what its uh, summary is, what subjects it relates to, uh, it's hit, this is really important, it's history um, of when did it pass, the, did it pass the House and when, was it vetoed, uh, is it awaiting a signature, you know, when did the Senate vote on cloture, etc. You know, these are just really core bits of information that if you were going to make a site like GovTrack, or if you were even going to make a site like Thomas, you have to have that in a database somewhere. Um, so, uh, you know, we gather this data, and this ends up going into GovTrack, ends up going into Scout, ends up going into a bunch of people's things. And we did this by isolating the work in its own project as a small part that, is, uh, that stands alone, that can be used for, for a bunch of things. Uh, so, a few other examples of uh, small parts empowering larger work. So this is actually a search for the word Obamacare in Scout. That right now it's just focused on bills in Congress. And you know, over the last couple of years, it's finally become uh, politically acceptable to use Obamacare in political language. Uh, it's no longer just a slur. Everybody talks about it that way now, so OK. But um, for a while, that wasn't the case. And you especially wouldn't, if you search for Obamacare, which lots of people do when they go to a search engine, it wouldn't actually bring up the Affordable Care Act or the Follow Reconciliation <coughs> Act. Like, there's, that's not a legal term. It doesn't appear anywhere. Um, I don't even know if it would appear if you typed it into Thomas. Um, but it should, because that's what people are looking for. Um, and there's a lot of ways people solve that. But most of the time when people want to do this, they just, you know, somewhere deep inside their system, they just have a little thing that's like, well, I found all these popular words, and like, if somebody types in this, make an exception and go here. Um, but, you know, we can actually take that and move it out and make that that knowledge of public good. So this is a, another project as part of the United States organization. It's just a bill nicknames spreadsheet. This is a, what's called a, comp, a CSV file. I bet you've encountered one at some point. It opens up in Excel real nice. Um, but it's, the data is actually really simple. And this is actually just gathering, like for every bill code that there's a relevant slang term for, what is that term? It's 
and just any comments you might have about why you're adding it. And you know, when you have this as data, when you capture this, then anybody can take this and load it into the systems. And that's what we do. We just take the spreadsheet and we load it automatically into our systems and empower our search engine with it. And you know, there's there's things that you can do that you know government may never do, right? So you know, when SOPA and PIPA were going around in early 2012, there were actually two bills, one in the House and one in the Senate. Um, and when pe but people would just search for one term or the other, and they don't understand that. People don't realize these are weird companion bills. They share some things in common, some things not. So when you type in SOPA, PIPA should also come up, and vice versa, I think. And, uh, but that's not going to be the decision that a government agency makes, because that's not very precise. Um, but we can capture that ambiguity here and, and establish that. And uh, since then, we've had a bunch of contributors add a bunch of new things uh, to it that make our search engine better and the search engine of anybody who wants to use, use the spreadsheet better. And again, GitHub makes this kind of collaboration very easy. Um, this is a very recent project that actually Waldo uh, has been a, a contributor to and a very uh, nice piece of energy for, um, which is a, the idea of a glossary. Uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit more sophisticated than a spreadsheet, but the idea is creating the same kind of public domain uh, representation of a glossary that anybody can use and work into their into their stuff. Um, and especially in this project, the emphasis is on making it easy for lay people to contribute. Um, sorry? And pleasant. And, and pleasant, exactly. A lot of, yeah, all, you know, if you go to the, the official glossaries on a lot of government agencies, you know, the emphasis is always precision. You know, they need, to, they're held to, accountable and liable for what they say. Um, but, you know, and, and they should be, and it's not wrong. But sometimes I think we could do a better job at explaining things better. Uh, I'm not saying I did the best job, but I wrote a definition for cloture that uh, you know is how I think of it. And cloture is something that comes up in, term, in, in process language all the time. You know, people have heard of what a filibuster is, but still, if you tell them there's a cloture vote on something, that doesn't necessarily mean anything to them. Um, so we've collected this here as data, uh, and we, we we publish it as data to the world. That's uh, through, we basically have an automatic process that takes the prose description that you type, turns it into data. Um, you know, kind of, it, it has a little bit of complexity that we kind of shove underneath the surface. Um, but the end result is you get to edit this and contribute, contribute prose. And the result is that we can do things like in Scout or anybody, uh, we can end up annotating the word closure and explaining it to people. Uh, and, you know, and anybody is free to draw from that, anybody is free to contribute improvements to it, and anybody who uses it will benefit. That's a nice model, and it's something that's you know that it's not branded. It's just a public domain, uh, you know, set of information. Uh, so something uh, a similar thing I want to draw some attention to that happened up in D.C. earlier this year is uh, there was a, a s small uproar about the availability of the D.C. code. I feel I feel like some people have I've heard of this and some reactions. Um, basically, this guy Tom McWright. Uh, drew sufficient attention to the fact that the DC code, though it's legally public domain in practice, uh, contractors have it locked down in a portal where you can't even link to specific things. In this case, he wanted to make a small mobile app for bikers and bicyclists in the city of DC, and he just wanted to link to the relevant bike laws. I just, I don't want to send them to the home page of the whole DC code portal and make them search for it. I just want to link them directly to it. When he realized that he couldn't do that as a matter of practice, that's what caused him to dig into the underlying legal issues. Uh, and you know, he was, and he made a, a strong argument. And before he ever did a lot of public campaigning, he met with the DC Council uh, several times. Um, was able, and actually, I, I should should have brought this up and, and uh, show it. But he actually ended up doing like a great. As a result of that, did like a fantastic uh, visualization of how bills become law in DC. Like he really dug into it. Um, from a policy and a technical perspective. And that was actually a battle that was won in the best way possible, where essentially the, the general counsel, the lawyer for the DC council, um, got, en ended up really becoming an ally on this, uh, ended up pu uh, publishing, uh, what they turned an unofficial version of, of the code, uh, basically just released it as a Word doc that was public domain. Um, and so Tom then started a project, an organization uh, to take that those word docs, turn it into data, and then make what they thought would be a better portal, and that's what uh, that's what we did. Tom is the per the main driving force, so I contributed a little bit. 
Um, so this is dccode.org uh, slash browser, and it's essentially just the idea is just to be a better code browser. That's all it really needs to be. Uh, it doesn't. It, 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 the point isn't to have it, you know, have the official stamp of legal officialness. The point is to have something that's useful that people can reference and have permalinks to, so that you can link to bike laws. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's done. A, Tom, Tom is a good developer and had good people helping them, and it's, it's in practice, it's a really nice little thing that's useful. Um, and I wanted to come back to legal citations uh, because the uh, one of the other projects here, just as a pay on this, again to small parts, is the idea of a legal citation extractor. This is something that I did last year that detects legal citations. Now, that's not a new idea. A hojillion people have created uh, citators as part of their work. Um, usually, though, they are baked into larger systems. Uh, they're, they're, they're engineered for whatever that organization or person's purpose is, and it's, it's lost. Even if it's open source, it's usually just deeply tied into whatever system they built. So the idea here is to build something that stands alone, uh, where you just, and you know, it's a little technical here, but you know, we're just sending text in, and it's, break, it's detecting and breaking out any citations it finds. This is the section 552, splitting it out. And that is all you need to do to make a bunch of good stuff happen. So when I, that search I showed before, and now I'm 10 tabs over, but let's see if I get back over here. Uh, this, this search here, you know, we use that library to essentially process every bill uh, before, uh, as we load it into our system and detect every citation, and then we can index it in our own system in the way that we need to so, so that we can turn up results like this. And uh, in the DC code browser, we can also use this. This is the same exact code as used to generate these links between things on the fly and to do things like link externally to DC laws uh, that are referenced in the DC code and to the DC register and whatever else we need to do. It's the same code being used in two wildly different places for two very different uses. Uh, but because we did this as a small part uh, and we took the time to break it out, and it's actually you know, really it's easy to build small parts, much easier than large systems, and we've empowered this to have a broader impact. Uh, so, I guess uh, I'm going to wrap up here in just a little bit uh, to talk about some policy a little bit. Uh, this is a post, uh, I, a blog post I wrote for some like a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Um, we've been lobbying, Sunlight and GovTrack and everybody uh, in the open government community has been lobbying the Library of Congress for a long time to, you know, make it so we don't have to reverse engineer your website anymore, basically, because when we do that, you know, we do it and we're happy to do it, uh, and occasionally it's fun, usually it's not, but it is certainly error prone because we're reverse engineering a website, and if they suddenly decide to start bolding something on their web page, it might break our stuff. So that's not, it's not a tenable situation. Um, I mean, it's, we've been doing it for a long time, but it's just not ideal. So uh, for a long time we've been lobbying them, uh, more recently, uh, the House in particular, uh, the House leadership and the House clerk, um, which is a, you know, part, of, part of the civil service part of the House, uh, have, have been great leaders in uh, publishing more and more information. They're, they're publishing uh, floor activity down to the minute in XML. Uh, they're pu they publish all their vote records within 20 minutes as XML. Uh, they publish upcoming stuff that's scheduled to be on the floor next week uh, as data in XML. Um, and they have been pressuring the Library of Congress to join the club uh, and do that. But the Library of Congress uh, has been incredibly resistant. And then finally, they, they, uh, they were forced to really get on the record about it. Uh, they, were, they were required to produce a cost estimate for publishing, uh, in this case, uh, just summaries, summary information as XML, just the summaries that uh, Library of Congress staff write to better describe legislation. They're still fairly technical, but they're better than the text of the bill. And in this, they you, basically they're just, you can tell that they hate the idea, and they bring up a bunch of things that uh, I found particularly offensive. So, so they say that when the information is hosted and mashed up by third parties, there exists no method for ensuring the information hasn't been tampered with or innocently misinterpreted. Distribution of bulk data will likely result in multiple alternative stores of legislative information, like the kind I just showed you, that to varying degrees are not as timely and therefore as accurate as Congress's primary systems. 
This, of course, is the very thing that we're trying to you know, ensure isn't the case by asking for data, and it's also really not that true anyway. There's an obligation to inform the general public of the risks of non-authoritative versions of the information that has not been included in the estimate. They also spent a little bit more time saying that if we release these bill summaries in XML, people could just start breaking down our doors, demanding CRS reports, and then the integrity of the Congressional Research Service will be in question and democracy will fail. So it's, it, it's, but the thing is that these arguments actually come up all the time. Authenticity, uh, authoritativeness, the idea that the government has the responsibility you know, not, not, they have the responsibility not just to be the provider of record, but, but, but to be the exclusive provider. And that that is part of how you be the provider of record. That's a, a very common, and in my view, dysfunctional way of viewing your role as, as, a, as a guardian of public information and as a provider. Um, and, you know, everybody else inside Congress, not everybody else, but a lot of people in the U.S. government and in parts of Congress have come around to the idea that releasing their information as data doesn't threaten their mission. It generally tends to empower them and engage them with a broader community of people and ultimately disseminate that information and better serve the purpose it was created in the first place to do. So and this, is, this just happened a few weeks ago, and this is the Library of Congress. This is the biggest library in the country, uh, with, you know, global influence. And this is, this is the attitude they take towards government information. So just wanted to let you know about that. Um, <laughs> And you guys have heard about PACER, uh, that's, you know, the, uh, I only actually logged on PACER for the first time uh, earlier this year when Carl Malamud was being sued by uh, a sheet metal manufacturer for publishing their safety codes, which you're legally bound to follow, online. Uh, and I wanted to follow that court case, so I logged into PACER, and as I was navigating around, I realized, you know, PACER talks about, like, you know, what we're, we're charging for. We're charging part of the page of the documents that you're downloading, which is crazy town. But they also, they don't just charge for that, because they take a very loose definition of page. As you're navigating through PACER, you're just, you, you haven't even loaded any documents yet. You've just chosen the next part of the PACER system you'd like to go to. That's also 10 cents. Like, they just charge you for whatever they can possibly get away with. And, you know, if we go back and we look at, like, what all the projects that we've looked at so far, you know, projects that are predicated on, on once you have the entire corpus of data, what you can make available that you didn't before, it, it really becomes very obvious that you, you cannot do anything with data when you're paying for it by the page. Like, the, that, yes, that makes, you know, it's not that bad if all you need is one opinion once for your research project or something, right? And that's usually the argument that, you know, you know, the people who really need this stuff in their work, they're not complaining. And, you know, and all, only legal professionals and lawyers and law firms need all this stuff, right? And that's essentially just a failure of imagination because the people who are working with every other branches of government's information, uh, it's, it's a lot more diverse than big law firms. There really aren't many big law firms involved in this at all. Uh, and we're doing things that involve the entirety of the information, uh, not just a piece of it. So. Uh, thanks, I hope that wasn't too, too much of an overload, and I think I still have some time for, for questions and everything, and uh, thank you very much. And you know what? 
Some people have feel strong feelings about ads, but uh, that funds the entirety of this website. It's not that bad, and it's worked for years. And, you know, and he just did this on his own. He didn't wait to get a grant. Uh, and you know, I don't think he, and it didn't get built up to the point where he had such sufficient hosting costs that he needed to put ads on it for a long time anyway. Um, so that is one thing. Uh, Court Listener was done as part of um, this guy, Mike. Yeah, his name is Mike Listener. Uh, <laughs> and, and, it, though his last name is spelled differently. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, he did this as, originally as part of his uh, graduate work at uh, Stanford, I believe, uh, working with a professor named Brian Carver. Um, I'm not sure what, what the sustainability model is going for, although he just he and Brian just founded a, a nonprofit called Free Law Foundation, uh, Free Law something, I think Foundation, um, that plans to be the center of sustainability for this going forward. Uh, and obviously, this is this is taxpayer funded. You you funded this at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, and the DC Code thing that was something that Tom did started in his spare time. A lot of the work in this got done at a hackathon on a weekend that they hosted at the company that he works for, a company called Mapbox. They just offered some space for the weekend. So um, yeah, so it's a variety of things. Sort of nonprofit vendor to the states. Um, we so we, we would much rather they do a better job of publishing data in the first place. And we are this is something that we're we've been doing for a while, but are, are not quite launched yet. So I'm giving you an advance peek. Um, but uh, we're essentially getting a little bit into the standards game of uh, recommending data formats for civic data generally. Um, and I, I I'm actually not involved with this personally myself, so I don't want to misrepresent it, and it's only just launching, but um, it's focused a lot on, on people. I don't think, uh, I, yeah, I mean, we, we want states to do a better job, a better job of publishing information, want them to publish this data, um, but when we get into, into standards work, that standards work is informed by, usually informed by our work on, on the ground. Um, so I don't know, I don't really have a, a great answer to you, but we do, give them advice all the time on how each of them can be doing a better job, more than just that report card. You know, we talk with those people at those legislatures and try to help them out with advice. But we, we haven't offered our software as a service to them. If law students wanted to volunteer to work on any projects, how would they go about doing um, So there's, uh, there's a, I mean, there's a few things that they could do, um, depending on their spectrum of technical Knowledge. Um, I'm trying to find the page here. Um, there's these are you know these are just a few projects that I called out. But I mean there's there there are, there are ways for people who don't have a, a technical background to contribute. And actually there's a, a there's a, a growing community of uh, legal hacker groups that has been really interesting. There's one that just started in D.C. Uh, and there's been a successful one in New York and one in San Francisco. Um, they're really trying to explore that, like bring lawyers and bring technologists into the same place. Um, and, you know, a lot of this stuff, like when I was doing legal citation work, like I really needed to, un I, had, I had like a blue book sitting in front of me that I'd never seen before, uh, you know, really trying to understand that. And, and people with that expertise could really help that project move a long way. We actually have, um, you know, a lot of this stuff, a lot of our, our, our work manifests not as code, but is actually just sort of talking about new ideas, uh, problems that we see in the, in the data, um, you know, how have committees in the House actually worked over time, uh, you know, how, how midterm changes worked. Um, this is, these are 19 open issues, we have like 127 closed ones, uh, some of which are technical, some of which are not. Um, also, I don't know, I mean, there's, there's ways to contribute your expertise in ways that aren't code. On the other hand, uh, I would, I, this is a drum I, I'm sure you've heard people beat before, but it actually takes a surprisingly low amount of technical knowledge to really meaningfully contribute to some of this stuff. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that GAO report uh, project that I, I did, basically one, maybe one or two days of, of work on my part to, 
to figure out how the website worked and gather that data. Um, and you know, I, recently I've just started uh, um, a project. This, is, this has gone nowhere yet. I just started it like a couple of weeks ago, and I haven't put in a ton of time yet. But um, this is to gather Inspector General reports from across the federal government. So we've we've made uh, we've done a little bit of work to uh, you know sort of go over every Inspector General. Uh, website, find out whether they have reports, you know, what the state that they're in is, etc. Prioritize them. And this was work that, you know, certainly law students or anybody could really do that you absolutely need and it took a lot of time. Um, but then also to actually adopt, you know, one of these inspector general offices and learn how their website works uh, and build a system that reliably, you know, can run every day and gather any new reports that they post. You know, that you don't need to have been a professional software developer to do that. That's actually something that you know uh, hobbyists can absolutely approach and make a very meaningful contribution to. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer or not, but it's certainly something that I think I think that's something that we need to be talking more clearly about and let, and really surfacing in a very direct way. Like, here's how you can help. A lot of people have tried to do to do projects like that, and I don't think anybody has really nailed yet like how to how to talk to people and engage them in a non-intimidating way, and also to make sure that in, in your work you're doing things that have a low technical barrier. I take that you limit your work to making publicly available information more easily available in the young approach. Sure. Is that right? Well, um, Certainly, I mean, yeah, it's something, like, something like we don't really engage with the idea of what should be classified or what shouldn't, that sort of thing. Um, and in general, we have sort of steered away from national security type issues. Um, so, yeah, it's more about taking what, and we, and we certainly, we advocate for more things to be made available. Um, we, we, th there's an open data executive order from a few months ago uh, that is, uh, is actually really great. I don't know if I'll. The, uh, is the open data policy for the federal government. And uh, the, one of the core aspects of this uh, is an inventory for data that every agency has so that we can even know what we should be asking for in the first place. Um, and it has some pretty strong mandates about, you know, public, publish the, the data sets that are public, but keep it an inventory internally of all the data sets you have, even that aren't public, and have that, you need to have that available, and that's foilable, uh, th those are foilable documents, and that's something we'll be engaging in as well. Um, but yeah, it's a little different than the national security sort of stuff. Have you ever had any legal action against? We've never been sued, uh, to my knowledge, um, about any of this stuff, and, because, yeah, we're, we're, we take, you know, it's, we don't really take the, Carl Malamud approach, for better or worse, of you know willfully, uh, you know really pushing the boundaries and uh, of, like legally of what you're allowed to do, and then settling it in the courts. That hasn't that just hasn't been our approach. Um, we are, in fact, we haven't ever sued anybody ourselves. And I think that's we are actually about to sue uh, for the first time over a FOIA uh, request that we've had into the federal procurement FedBizOps that. Uh, for some of their data. What's the Awesome Foundation? Oh, well that's not related to any of this stuff. Uh, that's I, that's a, a, a micro-granting organization that gives out $1,000 mini-grants to uh, things that we think are awesome. Uh, <laughs> the idea is to have no frills around that. But yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. It's about 50 people.